Hi, I'm Peter Burris, and welcome to Wikibon's Action Item. We're broadcasting once again from the Cube Studios in lovely Palo Alto, and I've got an, the uh, Wikibon research team assembled here with me. I want to introduce each of them. David Floyer, George Hi. Gilbert are here in the studio with me. Remote, we have Jim Kabilis, Stu Miniman, and Neil Raden. Thanks everybody for joining. Now, we're going to talk about something that is increasingly overlooked that we still think has enormous importance in the industry, and that is, does hardware matter? For 50 years, in many respects, the rate of change in the industry has been strongly influenced, if not determined, by the rate of change in the underlying hardware technologies. As hardware technologies improved, the result was that software developers would create software that would fill up that capacity. But we're experiencing a period where some of the traditional approaches to improving hardware performance are going down. We're also seeing that there is an enormous, obviously, move to the cloud, and the cloud is promising different ways of procuring the infrastructure capacity that businesses need. So that raises the question, with potential technologies constraints on the horizon and an increasing emphasis on utilization of the cloud, is systems integration and hardware going to continue to be a viable business option and something that users are going to have to consider as they think about how to source their infrastructure. Now there are a couple of considerations today that are making this important right now. Jim Kabilis, what are some of those considerations for uh, that, that increase the likelihood that we'll see some degree of specialization that's likely to turn into different hardware options? Yeah, Peter, hi everybody. Uh, I think one of the, the core considerations is that edge computing has become the new uh, approach to architecting um, enterprise and consumer grade applications everywhere. And edge computing is nothing without hardware on the edge, devices as well as hubs and gateways and so forth to offload and to handle much of the processing needed and much of increasingly it's AI, artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning. So going forward now, uh, looking at how it's shaping up, hardware is critically important burning AI, putting AI onto chipsets, low power, low cost chipsets that can do you know, deep learning, machine learning, natural language processing fast, cheaply in an embedded form factor, critically important for the, you know, for, for the development of edge computing as a, as a truly end-to-end uh, -end, uh, distributed fabric for, for the next generation of applications. So Jim, are we likely to see greater specialization of some of those AI algorithms and data structures and whatnot uh, drive specialization in the characteristics of the chips that support it, or is it all going to be just default down to TensorFlow or GPUs? It's, um, it has been GPUs uh, for AI. Much of AI, in terms of training and inferencing, has been in, cl in the cloud, and much of it has been based historically, tier to four, on GPUs, NVIDIA being the predominant provider. However, GPUs historically have not been optimized for AI because they've been built for gaming and consumer applications. However, the next generation, the current generation from NVIDIA and others of, of chipsets in the cloud and other form factors for AI incorporates what's called tensor core processing, really highly densely packed tensor core processing uh, components to uh, be able to handle uh, deep learning neural networks very fast, uh, very efficiently for inferencing and training. So, um, and NVIDIA and everybody else now is make, making a big bet on tensor core processing architectures. Of course, Google's got one of the more famous ones, their TPU architecture. They're not the only ones. So going forward, we're looking at in the AI ecosystem, especially for edge computing, there's a, there increasingly will be a blend of GPUs, like for cloud-based processing, TPUs uh, or similar architectures or device level processing, but also FPGAs, A6, and CPUs are not out of the running because, for example, CPUs are, are critically important, important for systems on a chip, which are quite fundamentally important for um, unattended operation as well as attended operation in terms of edge devices to handle things like natural language processing for conversational UIs. So that suggests that we're going to see a lot of new architecture thinking introduced as a consequence of trying to increase the parallelism through a system by incorporating more processing at the edge. Right. That's going to have an impact in volume economics and where uh, the industry goes from an architecture standpoint. 
David Floyer, does, does that ultimately diminish the importance of systems integration as we move from the edge back towards the core and towards cloud in whatever architectural form it takes? <clears throat> uh, I think the opposite. It actually is, uh, uh, systems integration becomes more important. Um, and the, the, the key question has been, can software do everything? Uh, do we need uh, specialized hardware for anything? Uh, and the answer is uh, yes, um, because the standard x86 uh, systems are just not improving in speed at all. Why not? Uh, <laughs> that's a long answer to that, but it's to do with uh, the, uh, the amount of heat that's produced and uh, the, the degree of, uh, of density that you can achieve. Uh, so the ability the to control itself. bits flying around the chip is Correct. going down as a consequence right. of dispersion of energy and heat into the chip. Uh, right, uh, and there are a lot of other or factors other as, as well. well. Sure. Um, but uh, the, the important thing is, uh, how do you increase the speed? And uh, a, a, a standard x86 uh, cycle time with its instruction set, that's now fixed. So what can you do? Well, you can obviously uh, reduce the number of instructions and then parallelize those instructions within that same space. And that's going to give you a very significant improvement. And that's the basis of GPUs and FPGAs. So GPUs, for example, you could have uh, floating point arithmetic uh, or, or standard uh, uh, numbers or extended floating point arithmetic. All of those help in calculations, large scale calculations. The FPGAs are much more flexible. Uh, they can be programmed in, in very good ways. So they're useful for smaller volume things. Uh, ASICs are important. Um, but what we're seeing is a movement uh, to specialized hardware to uh, process uh, AI in particular. And one area is very interesting to me is uh, to take the devices at the edge, what we call the level one uh, systems. Um, those those, uh, syst those uh, devices uh, need to be uh, programmed very, very intently for what is happening there. They are bringing all the data in, they're making that first line reduction of data, they're making the inferences, they're taking the decisions based on that information coming in, and then sending much less data up to the level twos above it. So what are examples of this type of system that exists now? Uh, because in hardware, volume matters. The, uh, the amount of uh, stuff you produce, the costs go down dramatically. And software too. In the computing industry, Absolutely. volume matters. I think Absolutely. it's pretty safe to say that. Yeah. Absolutely, so volume matters. So it's interesting to look at one of the first real volume uh, AI applications, which is in the iPhone X. Um, and uh, NVIDIA, sorry, uh, Apple have introduced the, uh, their latest chipset. It has neural networks within it. It has GPUs built in. Uh, and it's being used for simple things like face recognition and, and other areas of AI. Um, and the interesting thing is the cost of this. The cost of that whole set, the, the chip itself is $27. The total cost with all the sensors and everything to do that sort of work, AI work, is uh, $100. Uh, and that's, that's a very low bar, uh, very, very difficult to introduce in other ways. So this level of integration uh, for the consumer business uh, in, in my opinion, it's going to have a very significant effect uh, on the choices that are made by manufacturers of devices going into industry and other things. They're going to take advantage of this in a, in a big way. So Neil Radin, we've heard, uh, or we've been down the FPGA road, for example, in the past, data warehousing introduced, or, or there was, it was thought that uh, data warehouse workloads, which were, did not necessarily lend themselves to a lot of the prevailing architectures in the early 90s, could get this enormous acceleration by giving users greater programmable control over the hardware. Uh, how'd that work out? Well, it, for Netiza, for example, it actually worked out pretty well for a while. 
Um, but what they did is they used FPGA to kind of handle the low-level data stuff and, and, and maybe reducing the complexity of a query uh, before it was passed on to the CPUs where things ran in parallel. Uh, but that was before Intel um, introduced um, uh, multi-core chips, and it kind of, uh, it kind of killed the effectiveness. And the other thing was it was highly proprietary, which made it impossible to take up to the cloud. Um, and there was no programming. I, I always laugh when people say FPGA because it should have been called FGA um, because, <laughs> because there was no end user computing of an FPGA. So that means that we, although we still think we're going to see some benefit from this, but uh, it kind of brings us back to the cloud because if hardware economics are improved at scale, then that says that there are a few companies that are likely to drive a lot of the integration issues. If things like FPGAs don't get broadly diffused and programmed by large numbers of people, but we can see how they could in fact dramatically improve the performance and quality of workloads, then it suggests that some of these hyperscalers are going to have an enormous impact ultimately on defining what constitutes systems integration. Stu, take us through some of the challenges that uh, we've heard recently on the cloud, uh, or on the cube at reInvent and other places, about how we start seeing some of the hyperscalers make commitments about specialized hardware, the role that systems integration is going to play, and then we'll talk about whether that can be replicated across more on-premise types of systems. Sure, Peter, and, and to go back to your, your opening remarks uh, for, for this segment, you know, does hardware matter? Uh, when we first saw cloud computing roll out, uh, many people thought that this was just, you know, undifferentiated commodity, uh, you know, equipment. But if you really dig in and understand what the, the hyperscalers, the public cloud uh, companies are doing, uh, they really do uh, what, what I call hyper-optimize the solution. Uh, so when, when you know James Hamilton and AWS talks about their infrastructure, uh, they don't just you know take components and you know throw a bunch of stuff from off the shelf out there. They, they build for you know every application uh, a configuration and they just scale that to tens of thousands of nodes. Uh, so like what we had done in the enterprise before, which was build a stack for an application, uh, now uh, the public cloud does that for services and for you know applications that they're building up the stack. Uh, so hardware absolutely matters, um, you know, and in, in, in if we look not only at the public cloud, but you, you mentioned on the enterprise side, uh, it's where do I need to think about hardware? Where do I need to put time and effort? Uh, what David Floyer's talked about is that, you know, integration is still, you know, critically important, um, but, you know, the enterprise should not be worrying about taking all of the pieces and putting them together. They should be able to buy solutions, uh, you know, leverage platforms that take care of that environment. Uh, you, you know, very timely discussion about uh, all of kind of the, the Intel issues that are happening. If I'm using a public cloud, well, I don't have to necessarily worry about, you know, I need to worry about that there was an issue, but I need to go to my supplier <laughs> and make sure that they are handling that. And if I'm using serverless technology, uh, obviously, you know, I'm a little bit detached from what that, you know, whether or not I have that issue and how that get resolved, gets resolved. So, you know, absolutely hardware is important. Uh, it's just who manages that hardware, what pieces I need to think about uh, and, and where that happens and, you know, the fascinating stuff happening in like the AI pieces that, that Jim's been talking about, uh, where, you know, you're really seeing some of the, the differentiation and innovation happening at the hardware level to make sure that it can uh, react for those applications that need it. So we've got this tension in the model right now. We've got this tension in the marketplace where a lot of the new design decisions are going to be driven by what's happening at the edge. As we try to put more software out to where more human activity or system activity is actually taking place. And at the same time, a lot of the new design and architecture decisions being first identified and encountered by some of the hyperscalers. The workloads are at the edge, the new design decisions are at the hyperscaler, latency is going to ensure that there is a fair amount of, a lot of workload that remains at the edge, as well as cost. So what does that mean for that central class of system? Are we going to see, as we talk about TPC, true private cloud, becoming a focal point for new classes of designs, new classes of engineering? Uh, are we going to see a 
uh, uh, Dell EMC box that says designed in Texas or designed in Hopkinton. And is that going matter to matter to users? David Floyer, what do we think? Um, so it's really important for, from the consumer point, from, from the customer's point of view, that they can deal with a total system. Uh, so uh, if they want a system at the very edge, the level one we want, to do something in the manufacturing. They may go to Dell, but they may also go to Sony, or they may go to uh, Honeywell, or NCL, Huawei, or, or who knows? Huawei, yes, uh, Alibaba. There, there are a whole number of probably new people that are going to be in that space. When you're talking about systems on site for their, uh, for their higher level systems, level two and above, um, then they are going to be very, uh, uh, it will be very important to them that the service level that comes from the, uh, from the manufacturer, the integration of all the different components, both software and hardware, come from uh, the, that manufacturer. He, he is organizing it from a service perspective. Uh, all of those things become actually more important in this environment. It's more complex, there are more components, there are more FPGAs and, and uh, GPUs and all sorts of other things connected together. It'll be their responsibility as the deliverer of a solution to put that together and to make sure it works and that it can be serviced. And very importantly, to make sure, as you said, the works can be serviced, so that it's yeah. going to be there. So the differentiation will be, does the design and engineering lead to simpler configurations, simpler change, uh, accommodate the programming requirements, accommodate the application requirements, all that are uh, approximate that. to the yes. realities of where yeah. data needs to yeah. be. George, you got a comment? Yeah, um, I got to say, having um, gone to IBM's IoT event a year ago in Munich, it was pretty clear that um, when you're selling uh, these new types of systems that we're alluding to here, it's more, it's like a turnkey appliance. It's not just bringing the Intel chip down, it's, um, as David and Jim pointed out, it's uh, a system on a chip that's got transistor real estate for specialized functions. Um, and it, because it's not running the same scalable clustered software that you find in the cloud, you have small foot, footprint uh, software that's highly verticalized or specialized. So we're looking at low, lower volume, specialized turnkey appliances that don't really share the architectural and compatibility uh, uh, traits of the enterprise uh, and true private cloud sort of cousins. And we're selling it Mo for the most part to new customers, the operations technology folks, not IT. And often you're selling it in conjunction with a supply chain master. In other words, uh, an auto OEM might go to the, their suppliers in conjunction with uh, a, another vendor and sell these sort of edge devices or edge gateways. And so that raises another very important question. And Stu, I'm going to ask this of you. We're not going to be able to answer this question today. It's a topic for another conversation. But one of the things that the industry is not spending enough time talking about is that we are in the midst of a pretty consequential shift from a product orientation in business models to a service orientation in business models. Uh, we talk about APIs, we talk about renting, we talk about pay as you go. And there is still an open question about how well those models are going to end up on premise uh, in a lot of circumstances. But Stu, when we think about this notion of the cloud experience, uh, provided a, or providing a common way of thinking about a cloud operating model. Uh, clearly, the design decisions that are going to have to be made by the traditional providers of integrated systems are going to have to start factoring that question of how do we move from a product to a service orientation along with their business models, their way of financing, et cetera. What do you think is happening? Uh, where's the state of the art in that today? Yeah, and, and Peter, it actually goes back to uh, when, when we at Wikibon launched the true private cloud research uh, a little bit over two years ago. Uh, it was not just saying, how do we do something better than virtualization? It was really looking uh, at, at, as you said, that cloud operating model. Um, and what you know we're hearing very loud from uh, customers today is it's not that they have a public cloud strategy and a private cloud strategy. They have a cloud strategy. And one of the challenges that they're really having is how do they get their arms around that? Because 
uh, today. Uh, they're private cloud and they're public cloud. Uh, a lot of times, you know, th th it's different suppliers, it's different operating environments, as, as you said. We could spend, you know, a whole nother call uh, j just discussing s some of the nuance and, and pieces here. But, uh, you know, the, the real trend we've been seeing uh, in, in the, kind of the second half of last year and, you know, big thing we'll see, I'm sure, through this year is, you know, what are the solutions and how can customers you know, manage this much simpler and, you know, what are the technology pieces and operational uh, and paradigms that are going to help them through this environment. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it's a little bit detached from some of the hardware discussion uh, we're having here because, uh, of course, at the end of the day, it shouldn't matter what hardware or what locale I'm in. Um, it's, uh, you know, but it how does. I manage the entire <laughs> environment. Yeah. It should but, matter, but, 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 but the reality right, is, it, it, I think we're concluding it, that it does. Right, I mean, we think back to, you know, oh, back in the early days, oh, virtualization. Great, I could take any x86. Oh, wait, but I had a BIOS problem. And that broke things. So, you know, when containers rolled out, we had the same kind of discussion as, oh, wait, there was, you know, something down at the storage or networking layer that broke. Um, so, you know, it's it's always right. Where is the proper layer? How do we manage that? Right, I for one have just continue to hope that we're going to see the Harry Potter computing model show up at some point in time. But until then, magic is not going to run software. It's going to have to run in, on, on hardware and that has physical and other realities. All right. Thanks guys, let's, uh, let's wrap this one up. Let me give some uh, what the action item is. So this week we talked about the importance of hardware in the marketplace going forward, and partly it's catalyzed by an event that occurred this week. A security firm discovered a couple of flaws in some of the predominant common standard volume CPUs, including Intel's, uh, that have long-term ramifications. And while one of the fixes is not going to be easy, the other one can be fixed by software. But the suggestion is, is that the fix, that software fix would take out 30% of the computing power of the chip. And we were thinking to ourselves, what would happen if the world suddenly lost 30% of their computing power overnight? And the reality is, a lot of bad things would happen. And it's very clear that hardware still matters. And we have this tension between what's happening at the edge, where we're starting to see a need for greater distribution of function that's performing increasingly specialized workloads, utilizing increasingly new technology. That's not, that the prevailing stack is not necessarily built for. So the edge is driving new opportunities for design that's going to turn into new requirements for hardware that will only be possible if there's new volume markets capable of supporting it and new suppliers bringing it to market. That doesn't, however, mean that the whole concept of systems integration goes away. On the contrary, even though we're going to see this enormous amount of change at the edge, there's an enormous net new invention in what does it mean to do systems integration. We're seeing a lot of that happen in the hyperscalers first, in companies like Amazon and Google and elsewhere. But don't be fooled, the HPEs, the IBMs, uh, the Dell EMCs are all very cognizant of these uh, approaches and these changes and these challenges, and in many respects, a lot of the original work, a lot of the original invention is still being performed in their labs. So the expectation is the new design models being driven by the edge, plus the new engineering models being driven by the hyperscalers will not mean that it all ends up in two tiers, but we will see a need for modern systems integration happening in the true private cloud, on the premise, where a lot of the data and a lot of the workloads and a lot of the intellectual property is still going to reside. That, however, does not mean that the model going forward is the same. Some of the new engineering dynamics or some of the new design dynamics will have to start factoring in how the hardware simplifies configuration. For example, FPGAs have been around for a long time, but end users don't program FPGAs. So what good does it do to reflect the FPGA capability inside a box, inside a true private cloud box, if the user doesn't have any simple, straightforward, meaningful way to make use of it. So a lot of new emphasis on improved manageability, AI for ITOM, ways of providing application developers access to accelerated devices. This is where the new systems and design uh, uh, issues are going to manifest themselves in the marketplace. Underneath this, when we talk about Unigrid, we're talking about some pretty consequential changes ultimately in how design and engineering of some of these big systems works. So our conclusion is lots that the hardware still matters, 
but that the industry continues to move and drive in a direction that reduces the complexity of the underlying hardware. But that doesn't mean that users aren't going to have to aren't going to encounter uh, serious, decis uh, serious decisions and serious issues regarding which supplier they should work with. So the action item is this. As we move from a product to a service orientation in the marketplace, hardware is still going to matter. That creates a significant challenge for a lot of users because now we're talking about how that hardware is rendered as platforms that will have long-term consequences inside a business. So CIOs, start thinking about 2018 as a year in which you start to consider the new classes of platforms that you're going to move to because those platforms will be the basis for simplifying a lot of underlying decisions regarding where is the best design and engineering of infrastructure going forward. Once again, I want to thank my Wikibon teammates, George Gilbert, David Floyer, Stu Miniman, Neil Raden, and Jim Kabilis for a great action item. From our theCUBE studios in Palo Alto, this has been Action Item. Talk to you soon.